She does not do things by direction. She does what she thinks is right. And she usually is right. I mean, she's kind, good, walks with you, stays with you, does what she should. But if you like give her a command, she looks at you like, what am I doing wrong? Let's welcome to the show the marvelous Miss Mary Swift. You and I worked together in two 48-hour film festivals in the mid-2010s. But when did you actually begin to act? I began acting from the time I was a little kid. I lived alone in the country, and I had to play by myself. So I would make up stories and act them out back in the yard. And then I took and moved along, studied ballet, and then went to the University of Chicago. And then after the University of Chicago, after a while there, I ended up going to Goodman Theater School. When I was at the University of Chicago, there were a lot of famous people there that I discovered later. And one of them that I was directed by was Mike Nichols. I knew Mike Nichols and Elaine May, but my mother wouldn't let me work with them because they worked in a bar. They were very clever. I mean, really, really witty and clever. So what sort of project was that with them? I did a short stage play that Mike Nichols directed. The group was called Tonight at 8.30. I had a small role and whatever happened, who knows. And then a while later, in fact, actually after I'd gone to Goodman, I went back and auditioned again to the University of Chicago area for court theater. And um, I did a show in court theater. I was Mariah in Twelfth Night. That was who I was. So do you have a favorite role that you've acted in? It's hard to know a favorite role. I really like, I always like the project I'm in. The project I'm in is the one that captures my interest. And so I get involved in that. So what is it about acting that you enjoy? I enjoy moving out of the ordinary world that we live in and moving into another world, a different place as a different person. And it's sort of fun to be somebody different. So is that how you choose your projects? If it's something that's far removed from who you are in real life? I don't get to choose as much as I would like. I really am sort of like caught with having to audition and try and whatnot and see if I get chosen. I don't have all that kind of control of where I go. Were you ever a full-time actress or did you have to do other jobs too? I married young. We had a child. We didn't have a lot of money. So a, a career as an actor was not really there. So I ended up various kinds of ways, but I ended up working for the school system in Fairfax County for a long time. And finally, they offered to give me money to not have to work. I retired. Wonderful. I ended up being able to do much more acting all the time. So then at that point, I took and I started to make more efforts to work other places and work other shows. Excellent. Well, I wanted to talk about how important it is for those of us in the arts to feel like we have some support when we follow our passions. So is there a person who believed in you and your acting aspirations when you felt like no one else did? Way back, way back, I met a fellow named Omar Shapley, and this was at the University of Chicago. He took and was the host for a classical music program. And Omar used to, we were friends, and he would come to anything I was doing and watch me. And he would always say what he thought I was doing right or not right. He didn't direct me, but he really was able to tell me if I was giving what I could do in that time. So anyway, so life went on, all kinds of moves, different kinds of things. And many years later, Omar ended up uh, teaching, I think it was at CCNY, uh, taught acting there. And he was part of a second city group that went around the country. And we sort of lost track of each other because I was living in different places and he was living in different places. And we were both married to other people and all this kind of thing. But I think Omar was really a person early on who did that for me. Periodically, I worked with a couple of other people who seemed to have some faith in me and suggested various times that, why am I bothering with the school system? Why don't I just go off and act? It didn't work. 
but not until after they started retired me and sent me money. Well, I want to talk about your friend giving you feedback. I mean, I think it's so valuable to be open to constructive criticism because it benefits the art. But some people are so sensitive about that and don't want to hear what other people's interpretations might be. When you're working as an actor, you're working inside yourself, trying to get things that are inside you out. But it's hard to know what's being seen of you. So a lot of times when you think you're doing something or when you think it's coming across one way, it's not. The outside doesn't see the same thing you think you're putting out. And of course, that's where a good director comes in. But you try and put something out. And it's really helpful if somebody is there that can tell you, yeah, that's coming or that's not coming out. A good director does it, but sometimes you're caught with the fact that a director is involved in the whole show or the whole situation, and they don't have that much time or energy for you personally. It's nice to have that friend, but those friends are very rare, and you don't often get them. That is very rare. Well, Miss Mary, I'd like to talk about travel on the show. Can you tell us about what adventures you've had in other countries? So I did go to various regional theaters around the country and work at those. But the big thing was when I had a chance to go and travel with my husband, because he was traveling primarily in the Eastern European area. I went with him for a long trip to the old Soviet Union. And the first place we went, what well, I went with him, was to Tbilisi, Georgia. And I love Tbilisi, Georgia. Georgia has a, it has a wonderful kind of spirit. And there I ended up meeting a woman named Kati Delizzi. And Kati and I are still very good friends. Kati's father established the film industry in Georgia. And so we did a lot of crazy things with film there. We ended up, you know, seeing a lot of the films. We ended up borrowing things like the horse and carriage and riding through town and the KGB officers, because I was, you know, in the Soviet Union, they were watching you. And uh, they didn't really know quite what to do with me riding around and on horses and chariots around the town. But it was fun. The next place we went was in um, Irkutsk in Tashkent. Irkutsk was not anywhere near as interesting a place as, um, for me, as Georgia. But I ended up meeting one other actor, and he was assigned, I was assigned to him by the KGB, because the KGB was always watching you when you were, you know, on a diplomatic passport there to see if you were doing anything wrong or anything that they could blame you for. Well, anyway, he was supposed to write up what I was doing and where I was and whatever. And he and I got to be good friends. So I would write up my reports for the KGB about what I was doing and where. And so that was sort of fun. And in Siberia, I, I enjoyed Siberia again. It was sort of like the Old West. Um, it was very different. And at that point, I did get involved with the theater again. I very much enjoyed it. I did a one-woman show in uh, Irkutsk, and uh, it was a play I had worked on before. And uh, I still do it periodically. One of the biggie things, or biggie to me, was because Katie and I were good friends, she invited me to come back to um, Eastern Europe, at that time to Poland, where I did a movie with her. And we did a movie in Krakow with the setting being a castle, but a castle that had been run by robbers. They had a castle. It wasn't like the big castle, you know, for the king or the official, but it was a castle. And um, while we were shooting the movie, I ended up getting to play in the, in the castle. And that was fun. The star of the movie was a fellow named Daniel Obreski, who was a big, big star in Poland, to the point that on the theater in Warsaw, the whole big wall of the theater was his portrait painted on it. Daniel did things in France and Germany and, uh, and some things in the United States, too. He was, he was a really big, big star, really incredibly dramatic and tremendously good. He did a wonderful Macbeth, where Macbeth was a petulant child. It was a really, really dynamic kind of uh, portrayal. 
That sounds like a positive experience working with someone like that. Now, at one point, you've worked with someone very unpleasant. Do you remember that circumstance? Oh, yes. I did a lot of plays in a lot of places, but I ended up doing a play here in Annapolis. And the woman that I was working with was really nasty. She would take and throw wrong lines at me. She would take my props. She would take and change things. And I am like, I'm trying to work. It was really, really very difficult. And uh, if we were supposed to work on things, she wouldn't show up. Or she would belittle me or contradict me or throw things off for me. It was really, really rotten. I think I would use the B word for her. So did the director see any of her behavior? The director tried to support me. This was a community theater, so you didn't have the same kind of support that you would have someplace else. And she had been involved in that place before. So she had a little bit more support than I did coming in cold. You know, the show is the thing. And you always do what is needed for the show. And you try to put up with whatever the heck happens and just go along. Sometimes just going along with people who are rotten is not the best idea. But you do it anyway, right? Do what you have to do, I guess. Do you prefer voiceover work then since you'd be alone in a booth? I like stage work. Stage work is is by far the most fun because you're always, they're really completely in. And you have more freedom in stage work than you do in um, film work. I used to like to do voice things um, and play with my voice and make it do various things. But when you do the kind of voice work that you do in a booth and you're recording things, it's one, very lonely. It's two, very confining. And it's hard. You're not getting any kind of feedback. You have to have a different kind of personality than I have that you can be happy with what's happening while you're just sitting there alone in your box. Yes. And you're not getting the energy from other people on a scene. That is very different. Well, I think it's a communication art theater. We are communicating. And if you're doing voiceover work, for the most part, you're communicating, but you don't know it. You're not getting anything back until after it's all done. Yes, you're getting energy from scene partners in live theater. Now, do you also use the energy coming from the audience? Oh, yes. You want to get that kind of feeling that something is happening, that you're not just doing this all alone. You're doing this as part of a of a whole environment. And the audience is a big part of that environment. People who don't do theater don't really realize how much we feel what the audience is doing and how much that affects us. We know if they're receiving the information or not. We, we can feel the fact that they are with us, that they care about what we're doing, that we are touching their, their feelings. So it seems like a constant back and forth. Definitely. There are some actors who seem to be able to work very, very well technically. And they don't seem to need the audience very much. They have that going into themselves. But for others of us, we really need to be able to get the feedback from the audience to be able to keep the energy there. True enough. Well, I wanted to switch gears, Ms. Mary. I had gone to your home in Virginia, but then you moved to Maryland. So can you tell us about the Arts District? This is very different for me. I had lived in in Great Falls, and we had acreage and trees and woods and back out and things in the country. And when my husband died, I was moved here by my family so they could take care of me. Not that they do it very well. But anyway, here I live right downtown Annapolis. I am in what is called the Arts District. On every lamppost, there's a sign that says Arts District. I can walk to any of the museums. I can walk to the ballet. I can walk to the symphony. I can walk to the theater. And the other thing that's here is I have a whippet dog. And she is a very lovely, elegant, whatnot creature. And so when I go anywhere, walking with Darcy, everybody stops to pet Darcy and to talk about her because she is so lovely. She is very good. I'm looking over to the side because she's usually sitting right beside me or really very close. But she's always like on a couch or a chair. Those whippets don't have much fat. 
So they always look for something that will be soft. Yes. Tell me about Darcy's family. The whole line under pedigree. They have all been champions. They're all very pretty, which is why Darcy is very pretty. And they all have shown and done all this kind of thing. Darcy does not care to show. She still chooses to essentially do her own thing. And that's how I ended up getting her because they had wanted to show her and she wouldn't show. So there. It's like being a model. You have to like do your thing. You have to show yourself off. She's just pretty laid back then. Oh, very laid back. Very sweet. So now tell me how Tai Chi is going. You know, you've got to try and keep the whole body working. And so I, in terms of being able to move freely and balance and do all kinds of things that keep your body working as it should, you need to exercise. And so I try. But... I am trying to do Tai Chi so I don't fall on my head. And it's a lot harder than I thought it would be to hold those positions, to keep the balance, to do all those things in the right way. I've also tried Pilates. I think it's going to kill me. But I am trying to fight my way to being able to keep the body working. You must have good motivation to keep making the effort to move around. Well, hey, if you don't keep your body moving, you're going to be stuck someplace. And I'm willful enough that I want to do what I want to do. And if your body doesn't cooperate, you're going to have a tough time. Then you're going to be stuck. I had an old coworker in Florida that used to say, to rest is to rust. I think she's right. And, and, and when you rust, you know, it all gathers up and you're stuck in those places. Exactly. I did want to talk about your love for tending to flowers. Do you still have your green thumb? Well, my thumb is not that green, but I do like them. And I, I love the fact that if you're sort of careless and put them in, they just bloom and wonderful things happen. And so when I'm sort of careless about where I've planned to things, oh, wow, something comes up here. Oh, wow, something comes up there. You know, sometimes I don't remember exactly what I put in where, but oh, there's a wonderful surprise. I still have some asters coming up. Mums, you know, the mum kind of things. And they're all of a sudden, yeah, I didn't even remember they were there. So they look really all the nice. I have an ash tree, which is very pretty. And it has gotten to be gold leaves. And the leaves have fallen and they cover the entire yard. So the whole yard has this gold kind of look. Yeah, it gives you something pretty to look at. All right, Miss Mary. Well, thank you for being so generous with your time with me today. It's been a joy. Did your wine get delivered after all? No, there's supposed to be 12 bottles coming. I wish we could all join you for a party. You've got to come by and visit. I would love that. Thank you for stopping by to hear today's guest. I'm wishing you well with all your endeavors. Until next time.